welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to go and get down on my knees. I need prayer. I know you need prayer. So I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord, Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me? And let's uh, prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord today. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to hear from the old or the young. Lord, we don't come to hear from the white, the black, or the brown. Or God, we don't come to church for, for tradition or ritual or, heaven forbid, even entertainment's sake. But God, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this house. And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to be our teacher, our guidance, our counselor today. Lord, I pray that your word would be a, a seed planted into our hearts and into our lives, that we would have good ground in that, Lord, that we would leave and bear much fruit as we cultivate the word that we've learned today. Lord, that we would go out there and be a reflection of your love to a lost and dying world. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. We don't ask these blessings solely upon ourselves, but Lord, upon all the churches across the world and around the Inland Empire that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. We never think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but Lord, we truly do see ourselves as brothers and sisters, co-laborers, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So Father, we thank you for our, our neighbors and our brothers and sisters locally. Lord, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Baptist and Lutheran and Presbyterian and Episcopalian Methodist brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for our Charismatic and Pentecostal and Foursquare brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our Sabbath day, uh, Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters and our Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters. God, we lift up all the churches locally around the area for Harvest, for Grove, for Sandals, for the Well, the Way. Father, we thank you for Ecclesia, for Emmanuel Baptist, for, uh, uh, for Victory. Father, we thank you for, uh, for Crossroads, for New Creation, Lord, for Abundant Living. All the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world, too many to name. We thank you that we are all many members of one body. That is the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. And to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. 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 Praise God. As you're grabbing your seats, go ahead and get your Bibles out. We're going to be going into the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in the ninth chapter, resuming our study. Line upon line, precept upon precept. We are in Hebrews in the ninth chapter. I'm excited for what we've got based on the reaction of first service already and Sabbath service. Let me just advise you. Buckle your seatbelts. We are getting into the Word of God if you're taking notes, maybe you need to do a little bit of hand circles, get that wrist warmed up. If you're using your tablet or your phone, I don't know, pop your knuckles or whatever you got to do, get those thumbs loose. Because I tell you what, you're going to get some amazing truths out of the Word of God. And for those of you that are just joining us, what we do here at the church is we go line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible was written that way. We study it that way. It forces us to see things in context the way, the, the way God had desired them so that we can't just pick and choose what we want to believe, but rather we are forced to believe what the Word of God says and how it says. So here we are in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in the ninth chapter today, we're going to be reading from the sixth verse. Let me give you just a quick, just a quick segue into where we're at. The book of Hebrews, given uh, uh, by its namesake, was written to the Jewish believers. Uh, and Hebrews being written to the Jewish believers contains a lot of things that those Jewish believers 2,000 years ago would have understood, would have been readily available. They would have been educated in these principles and in these precepts. That way, it, it, it serves as a great object lesson to learn some truths. Now, the hard part is, is that I don't know anybody in this room that was alive 2,000 years ago or that, it, that, that understands these things by way of use because, you see, we live in a different day. We live in a different age. So sometimes the things that we read, especially the things that we're getting into today, it's sometimes we have the, the tendency to look at them and just kind of read over them and say, that's great, that's wonderful, grand, and move on to the things that we can understand. But today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Hebrews in the ninth chapter. We're going to look at some things that happen in the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament, but we're going to see nuggets of truth, and we're going to stop. Instead of doing a point one, point two, point three message like we would normally do, what we're going to do is we're going to read through some scriptures, and we're going to stop, and we're going to pause, and we're going to evaluate those thoughts and those scriptures and what they mean and how they apply to you and me today in our day and age, being uneducated in this kind of system, being unaware of what went on and how this applies to us in our day and age. So, 
Here we go in Hebrews, in the ninth chapter, verse number 6 says, Now when these things had thus been prepared. Now that's just a quick review of chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. If you were here last week, Pastor Dan talked about the, the holy place, and then the most holy place, or the place where God dwelt, there was a veil in between the two, a big, a great veil. The high priest would go in, and we'll see some of that today. There were some things that were prepared, the showbread, the representation of manna that the children of Israel uh, had collected in the wilderness. There was the lampstand, uh, uh, and there was, there was the table and, th- and the scepter inside, and then there was the, then there was the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the rod of Aaron that budded, as well as the tablets. There were certain things that were prepared, speaking of those. Now when these things had thus been prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. Now, if you look at this, I've got it highlighted on the screen. If you've got your Bible or if, you, if you're reading along, you know, take your pen or take your highlighter, whatever it might be, and highlight that word priests. Because here the author of Hebrews makes a designation to you and I. You'll see a stark contrast between verse 6 and verse 7, talking about the duties of the priests and the duties of the high priest. You see, the Bible describes you and us as a peculiar people, a holy nation. We are royalty, and at the same time, we, according to God, are a priestly people. We are a royalty to God's eyes. This reflects to us. Now, in that first room, if you remember or if you recall was the holy place. That's where the, the table was, the lampstand was, the, the showbread was displayed. This is where the priests would perform their daily duties. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing the word priests because this is all of those who were in that lineage, all of those who were in that position could go into this place. This was not the place that God dwelt, but rather the room before that, separated by a great veil. What this signifies, what this verse means to you and I, the priests performing their services, is that the daily services of the priest serve to remind us of our daily service unto God. You and I have a daily service unto God. You see, this held much symbolism with the Jews. They were very much so accustomed to daily offerings, to daily burnings of incense and trimming. They were accustomed to the daily gathering of bread or manna. They were accustomed to the daily ministering that the priests would make themselves available to the people. You and I, we have daily services unto God. We are called into a life of service to God and to others. Jesus Christ exemplified this in John the 13th chapter as he washed his disciples' feet and said that a servant is not greater than his master. I've done this to you. Now you go out and reflect this. Go out and do this. The book of Hebrews tells us that you and I have got a daily service to exhort each other every day while we have today. So you see, we have a daily service A daily service to God. We've used the term, you've heard the term, a Sunday Christian. God's desire is for us to not just be Sunday Christians, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday Christians. Looking now at verse number 7, we're going to continue to go through this. Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 7, says, but into the second part. Speaking of that room now separated by the veil, this is that that deeper room, the Holy of Holies. Into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year. One time a year, the high priest, now remember we talked about priests, now we're designating one man. The high priest went alone by himself one day a year into this one room. This has tremendous significance to you and I as this is the place, the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God dwelt. Therefore, it signifies that this was not open to just anybody. Not just any person could go into where the presence of God was. Only one man, one day a year. You see, what this did is it signified, it showed the separation of a godly God or a righteous God and sinful man. That's why there was a veil between the holy room where the priests could go and the holy of holies where only one could go. Because God is so righteous, the Bible tells us in Habakkuk, that he can't even look upon sin. So this is symbolic that the way to God was not totally closed off, but it was not accessible, readily accessible 
to men. Not just anybody could go into the presence of God. Not just anybody could make atonement for the forgiveness of sins. What this does is this shows us that the priests, Aaron, and the priests following Aaron, the high priest, could only act out and could only demonstrate that which Jesus Christ would eventually do. Okay, you got to get that, because you're looking at me like a cow at a new gate. The priests going into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, they could only demonstrate, act out like charades what Jesus Christ would eventually do. See, they went in, they had to come out. Jesus Christ would go into the presence of God once and for all and make sacrifice and atonement for sins. Looking on now to the second part of Hebrews, the ninth chapter, this is where we really get in to the significance of what we're talking about. The title of this morning's message is this, The Significance of Sacrifice. The Significance of Sacrifice. Looking at the second part of Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 7. The second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood. This is an interesting statement right here. Not without blood. If you look at the sum of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, a central theme you and I can pull out of that from Genesis to Revelation is this theme, not without blood. From the very beginning to the very end, blood was a central theme of the word of God. Look what it goes on to say, not without blood, which he offered for himself, very important that we see that, and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Blood has always been important to God. From the very beginning, we see that blood was used for the covering of sins. To signify that sin comes at a heavy price. From the very beginning, we see this in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve have taken from the fruit of the tree the knowledge of good and evil... They have now realized that they are sinful creations. Sin has come upon them and now upon mankind. If you recall the story, they put themselves in fig leaves. They sew leaves together and they hide. And now here's God saying, where are you? What have you done? Afterwards, it says that they were clothed in animal skins. In order to be clothed in animal skins, an animal's life has to be sacrificed. This is the very first time in the Word of God we see a shadow of the blood shed for the covering of sins. Because of their sin nature, they had to be clothed or covered. Blood is important to God. But why blood? In our day and age, in our society, who we are, blood is like nasty. You cut yourself, you're like, ugh, ugh. At least I am now. I'm one of those kind of people, I just can't handle it. If you see blood, you know, outside, somewhere outside of somebody's body, it is like, don't touch, don't go near, get somebody out here with one of those hazmat suits on, don't, uh, don't even go there. Some of you guys who eat meat, you're like, look, I don't even want to see a hint of moisture in my steak because I, I don't want to think about it. So why blood? It's hard for us to relate to this because we're so oh, anti, we're so, we hold that at such an arm's distance, but why blood? From the very beginning, starting with Cain and Abel, we see the need to cover sin. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and Cain and his brother Abel brought offerings to God to cover that sin. Uh, Cain brings an offering to God first, and this offering is the fruit of the land. It's the vegetables, it's the fruits, it's the things that come from the land. And Cain offers these to God. Cain's brother Abel brings the firstborn of his flock, the, the valuable, the precious, the innocent lamb, and offers that to God. And God honors Abel's sacrifice, and he rejects Cain's. Why did he do that? Because somebody had to be taught somewhere that, that our sins come at a heavy price and that not just anything will make atonement or forgiveness for who we are and what we have done. So God tells Cain, listen Cain, here's the deal. Sin's desire is to control you. You don't have to be that way, but you have to follow the example set before you. So why then blood? Here's the answer. Here's why it applies. Here's why it's important. Because the shedding of blood reveals the great cost of sin. The shedding of blood reveals the great cost of sin. 
The Bible tells us in Leviticus, God describes blood as the giver of life. That's why God forbade the children of Israel to drink it. Why? Because blood is what carries life. So therefore, the weight of our sin was so much that the fruit of the land, things that would grow back, things that would come back to us, was not enough to cover the sin that we as humans are born into and live into. So blood shows us the great cost of sins. Listen, the Bible's a bloody book. Yes, undoubtedly and unashamedly, the Bible is a bloody book. From the very beginning to the very end, blood is a central theme. Why? Because blood is what gives life, and therefore to shed it brings to us light the weight of our transgressions. Blood gives life. That's why you see the Red Cross. Give blood. Why? Because we need it. It's essential to life. Therefore, to shed it shows the weight of our transgressions. And what the Bible is doing here in the Old Covenant is showing us, is leading us eventually to the place where we become, where we see the gift and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is painting a picture of us of the cost of our transgressions. You see, things we can't buy our forgiveness with money. We can't buy our forgiveness with deeds. It had to be covered from the very beginning with blood. Like Abel, it cost him. Cain said, for my life, I will give to you what will grow back and come back to me. The Hebrews had to put blood of an innocent lamb on the doorstep of their house so that the spirit of death as he came across Egypt would pass over them. Aaron's sons came into the holiest place of all the place. They were not allowed without blood, and they were consumed by the presence of God. Why? Because God's central theme is not without blood. From Adam to Christ, nobody could approach the presence of God without blood. And from Christ to this day forward, no one can approach the presence of God without blood. Aaron dare not dare not, the high priest, dare not approach the presence of God or come into the presence of God without blood. Therefore, Jesus Christ, our great high priest, dare not come into the presence of God without blood, a greater blood. Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 8, goes on to say, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all the presence of God was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. You remember, tabernacle literally means a tent or a dwelling place, a temporary place. You see, what happens here is the Holy Spirit has orchestrated a great object lesson that the presence of God was not yet accessible to mankind in whole. But even during this season of restricted or limited access, one man could go before God once a year. The object lesson, the nugget of truth for you and I to grab a hold of out of the scriptures today is that you and I can only come to God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the one painting the object lesson here, which means that there is no other way for you and I to approach the presence of God except by Jesus Christ through or by way of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter that no one can confess Jesus Christ as Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus Christ has opened the door for us to have access to God by way of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, verse number 51, verse number 50 tells us that Jesus is on the cross. He cries out with a loud voice and he surrenders his spirit and he dies on the cross. Here, Jesus Christ has become a sacrifice, and we'll see that. Now, here is the significance. Understand this. Verse number 51 comes along, and as Jesus Christ dies, 51 says, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Get this. The veil is not like a curtain. Okay, don't think of the veil like, okay, there was this little, you know, they had pipe and drape kind of a thing, and they had like linen. This veil was nothing 
flimsy. It wasn't chintzy. It wasn't small. It was great. It was, it was thick because this was a very significant representation of the limitations of their access to God. Nobody could cross that. It took, it took the manpower to move this veil across so that the high priest could enter in. And here, as Jesus Christ surrenders his life and gives his life now on the cross and he has finally died, here it says, at that moment, the veil of the temple was torn from two. Like a piece of paper. It wasn't ripped. It wasn't just split, or it wasn't just, it didn't have a problem where you could sew it. It was torn in two, in two separate pieces. Now listen to this. Not from the ground up or from man's position to God so that we could remove this veil and get access to God. It was torn from the top down, from the position of God to the position of man by the Holy Spirit saying, Now the access has been granted and been given to you. Wow. We have access to God through the Holy Spirit. What an amazing thought. We no longer look to a tabernacle. We no longer look to a temporary dwelling place. But now we look to a heavenly sanctuary where God himself dwells on the inside of us. The Bible tells us that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians in the third chapter, verse number 16, talking about the Holy Spirit. But whenever someone turns to the Lord... Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What this means is that you and I, before Christ, live in a sense of separation between God. God's righteousness and our sinful nature kept us at distance from each other. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we come to Christ, we turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. We are now able to access to see the presence of God. Look what it says in verse 17. The Lord is the Spirit. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom to go to the presence of God. There's freedom now that you and I can boldly approach the throne and make known our petitions. The significance here, the priests would have been doing their daily duty in the holy place next to the veil. When that veil was torn, it was a significance. It was saying, hey, listen, your reign, your rule, this has come to an end. It has been fulfilled, and now we are in a new and better time. Amen. Looking now to Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 9, moving on. It was symbolic, verse number 9, for the present time in which, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect. In regard to the conscience. Listen to that. The sacrifice are offered cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with food and drink and various washings, different festivals, different ordinances. Imposed until the time of reformation. Throughout the entire old covenant, blood covered sin but it did not cover the conscience of man. Only the sins committed. God was bringing in this time of reformation a whole new way of life that wasn't about the law simply by abiding in it, but it was about the obedience of it from the heart outward. The nugget for you and I to grab a hold of is that the old sacrifice covered sin, but did not address the root of sin. Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Rather than just making atonement for our sins, Jesus begins to teach us that it's not just about the law on the outside or the regulation, but it's about the inside. He says something that was so counterculture to the Jewish people. He said it's not what goes in that defiles a man, but it's what comes out. You see, the law was about the outward. It was about covering the outward, but on the inside is what defiles a man. And Jesus Christ brings and he says the law is no longer about outward appearance. It is about the heart towards God. Speaking to the root of sin. Sacrifice was made for the forgiveness of the sin, but the heart of the sinner had not yet been dealt with. Thus, the birth of religious spirits. The sinner himself was still in bondage. Galatians in the third chapter, verse number 10, on the overheads, says in the New Living Translation, as by way of describing it easily in modern language, it says, those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. 
For the scriptures say, Curses everyone who does not observe and obey all the commandments that are written in God's book of the law. You see, the law Paul describes as a tutor, a guardian, a waypoint that would direct us to Jesus Christ. That's why he says, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill it. Why? Because now on the inside, now through me, you can fulfill all the commandments of God. Not because of abiding or by, by maintaining regulations, but because now your heart is in alignment with God. It's no longer about ritual. It's no longer about changing the garment to linen. Like the priest would shed his garments, his, his, his royal garments, and he would wear a linen as he goes into the presence of God as a sense of, of humility, as a sense of I am no longer a person of position or of establishment. I am a person who is wearing lowly clothes. Jesus now comes and presents this on our hearts, and the Bible tells us that you and I have got to humble ourselves before God. Humble ourselves. It's about the heart humbling ourselves and submitting to him. Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 11 goes on, and it says, But Christ came as high priest of good things to come, but with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not built with the hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Listen, with his own blood. Listen to this, with his own blood. He entered the most holy place, listen to this, once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. We have studied through the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. We've seen this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20, Hebrews chapter 7, 21, or 26, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus is our great high priest, but now, but now, the Bible, the book of Hebrews begins to paint him in a different picture. Not only is he our great high priest, but he is our final sacrifice. Jesus is our high priest and final sacrifice. That's why it says he went with his own blood, his own blood, once and for all. You know what that means? We don't make atonement by blood anymore for our sins because 2,000 years ago, as Jesus surrendered his life on that cross, your sins were covered. Even though you didn't exist, they were covered. Eternal redemption. What an amazing thought. He went into the presence of God with his own blood. Titus, the second chapter on the overhead or on the screens, says this. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin. To free us from every kind of sin. To cleanse us and to make us his very own people. We've studied Jesus as our high priest. But the fundamental difference between Jesus and Aaron and the high priests following Aaron is that Jesus had no need to make atonement for his sin. Jesus did not have to sacrifice blood for his own sin. That's the importance of the virgin birth. You see, remember, we talked about the, the blood sacrifice, the shedding of blood showed the weight, the heavy cost of our sins. And now here is Jesus not having to shed blood for his own because he came perfect, born of a virgin, removed from the nature of sin by way of man. And now here is Jesus perfect and spotless, offering himself as a sacrifice to you and I to show the heavy cost of our sins has been paid in full. <laughs> Hebrews in the ninth chapter. Now I told you, we're moving, man. We're going through this. Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse 13, verse 14 is where we conclude today, where we wrap it up, where we bring it all together. Look what it says in verse number 13. For if indeed... The blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies and for the purifying of the flesh, the outside, the outward of man. Listen to this. How much more? Verse 14. How much more? Get it. Got to get it, church. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Remember, one of the truths that we pulled out of this is that the sacrifice covered the sin, but not the root of it. 
How much more now through Jesus Christ, through his innocent blood, the blood that was shed for our sins, our transgressions, that we committed out of ignorance, the Bible says, we didn't even know. How much more now would we be cleansed, not just on the outside, but from the inside out? You see, you and I have a clear start. In conclusion for today, the question remains for us 2,000 years after these things ceased to happen. What does this matter to me? We can read the sacrifice. We can read the sacrament. We can read what they did in the Old Covenant. We can read about the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. Why does it matter to me? The answer is so simple. One word. Blessing. This matters to you because you're blessed. Why are you blessed, you say? Because we live in a better time. We live in a better covenant. We live in a better place because now how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse our conscience from dead works? If you recall in Hebrews in the 6th chapter when we talked about the dead works moving beyond dead works, dead works aren't what we think, oh, that those are the things that we did before we came to Christ. We define dead works as anything that you and I do that does not glorify God. So therefore, the Bible says, how much more now shall the blood of Christ cleanse us from everything that we do that doesn't bring glory to God? Do you know what this means? This means that you and I live in a time and in a place now that we are, it is possible that everything we do would bring glory to God. Everything we do in this life would glorify God. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from that. Not only have we been pardoned for our sins, we have been removed from the form that once committed them. Hebrews in the second chapter, Jesus Christ came as our high priest to release those in bondage. We were slaves to sin. We could not escape it. But Jesus Christ removes us from the form of sin. Romans in the eighth chapter, I'll put it on the overhead for you. The law of Moses was unable to save us. Why? Because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, the body of Jesus, God declared an end, an end to sin's control over us by giving his son a sacrifice for our sins. God declared an end to sin in the nature of our lives. That's why the nugget for you and I, if you don't get anything else, if you don't remember a word I say, remember this. Remember this. That the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin and transforms us into something totally new cleanses us from sin, and transforms us into something totally new. You know what this means? You are no longer who you were. Your past is not your past. Romans in the sixth chapter talks about us dying to Christ. We are dead to ourselves. Jesus says anybody who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Because you are looking back on something that does not belong to you. What belongs to you is your future in God. Because you are now who God says you are. Paul says on my life, I count it as waste. We often refer that to all, well, all the pain and the hurt and the suffering that we, that we get from, from serving God. I, I just count it all as loss. But if you read in context what Paul is speaking about, he's talking about everything he has to be a person of stature, a reason to brag or to boast. All of his accomplishments in life, he says, I count them as loss. Why? Because good and bad, I am no longer who I was. Now, I am God's in Jesus' name. We are no longer ourselves. Which brings us to the scripture that Christians so often refer to, and now it sheds perfect light on 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The Bible says this means that anybody who belongs to Christ has become a new person. 
The New King James says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. The old life is gone, church, and your new life begins. If that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't get you going, if that doesn't get your heart pumping, you need to pinch yourself to see if you're alive. Why? Because you have a new life. You have a new life. You have a new life in Jesus Christ because of the significance of the sacrifice. What does this matter? We look to the blood of Jesus Christ in the following weeks. You and I will learn that we're redeemed, we're cleansed, we're washed, we're forgiven, we're made new, we're justified. But today, as you leave today, the significance of the sacrifice, realize this about yourself. You are free. You are alive. You are fulfilled. You are righteous. You are exemplified. You are filled, overflowing in everything we do because Jesus Christ's blood covers us and transforms us into something totally new. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? Yes! Who knew that blood sacrifice could be so fun? <laughs> That's why I say the Bible is a bloody book, unashamedly and undoubtedly. People say, man, that book is just so bloody. Hallelujah. Thank God it is. Because it has made me new and transformed me, wiped away the old. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Listen, let me do one more thing today. I want to ask everybody, please, just give me a moment more of your attention. Give me just a few more minutes, please. Very important that we do this. Don't get up. Don't leave. Don't walk around. Listen to what I have to say. It's very important what you, that you hear what I have to say today. It'd be a tragedy for us to get together to hear the word of God and not give you the opportunity to examine, to look into your heart, to look into your life, and to, to examine and establish where it is that you stand in your relationship with God. So let me ask you this question by way of, of examining your heart and your life. Let me ask you this question. If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you open your eyes in heaven or would you open your eyes in hell? Very simple question. Where would you be? The question that follows is what makes you think that you're going to get to heaven? You see, what happens is we live in a society, we live in a day and age where we are fed or we are taught things from a very young age and we begin to accept them and believe them as truth without even realizing what we're, what we're saying or what we're you can't get to heaven because you, you think you're going to go. You're not going to get to heaven because you think so, or you want so, or you hope to. There's nowhere in the Word of God that it says that. Oftentimes we believe that, well, if I sit in church, then I'm going to go to heaven. That's why we go to churches, to go to heaven. My parents told me that I'm a Christian. Christians go to heaven. All my life I've called myself a Christian. I've got a cross around my neck. I, I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. I was baptized as a baby. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Word of God, will you find it because you're good? And will you find it because you think so, or because you want so, or because you hope to? Because your parents told you? Because you went to church? Because you were christened or baptized mean you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that. You see, the only way that you and I can get into God's heaven is God's way. Oftentimes we think, well, it's because I'm a good person. Heaven is a utopia or a reward for people who live good lives. But did you know that the Word of God says that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags? Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because God's standard is perfection. And yet the Bible says we have all sinned, all sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't do it on our own. But praise God that because it's God's heaven, He gave us a way, His way. Jesus Christ said that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through Him. We talked about that today. The only way we can get to God is by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. There's no other way. It's not because we're good, not because we think this way or act this way or because we were told this. The only way we can get into God's heaven is God's way, through Jesus Christ. Jesus was speaking to a man by the name of Nicodemus in the book of John in the third chapter. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. He knew the scripture. He taught the scripture. He gave the poor, did all the right things, said all the right things. And Jesus and Nicodemus are having the discussion about eternal life. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, in order to receive eternal life, you must be born again. Oh, 
You've heard that term. Popular culture, societies define that as weirdo, crazy, out of control, ridiculous Christianity. But let me tell you something. Why would you and I ever define something so important in our lives by, something, by someone who changes so much? Society changes and changes and changes. By evidence of that, look at the pants you have on versus the pants you wore 20 years ago. Why would, you, why would you define something so important as your eternal life by somebody or something that changes so frequently? Let's define it by that which never changes, the word of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ says that you must be born again. What does born again mean? It means that you've given God all of your heart. It means that you've given God all of your life. That's what it means. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. It's not about a token prayer, this or that. It's not about carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. Listen, you're here today. That's because you know who Jesus is. It's about giving him all your heart. It's about giving him all your life. Let me show it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. The church, not the world, not the Gnostics, not those who disbelieve, the church. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, and he says, I'm going to come back. When I come back, he says, I better find you hot or cold. Because he says, if I find you lukewarm, he will vomit you from his mouth. Shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying there is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. So what does lukewarm mean? Let's, let's define that. Let's clear it up a little bit for you. Lukewarm simply means in terms of your relationship with God that you're a little bit up and you're a little bit down, in and out. Occasional church attendance, doing some of God's thing, doing some of your own thing. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're kind of just floating around. Come on, let's be real. Let's discuss this like adults. If you were in any relationship, whether it be married, friendship, business, if you were occasional or you were just half-hearted in that relationship, you just kind of floated in and out, you know that it wouldn't succeed. You know that your marriage wouldn't succeed unless you gave it your all. You know that your friendships wouldn't succeed unless you gave them your all. Yet we think that we can just give God a little bit of us and that's good enough when God says, I want all of your heart, I want all of your life. Today I want to give you that opportunity all across this auditorium. In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to count to them. I'm going to go one, two, and I'm going to count to them. I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible real loud, just like that. I want to give you the opportunity all at the same time. Here's what I'm going to do. When I smack my hand on my Bible, bam, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to be bold, to make a profession, to say, listen, raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give him my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to make sure today I get into heaven. I acknowledge that. I want to do this today. You see, Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before man, He'll confess you before his father. If you deny him before man, he'll deny you before his father. I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. You say, Pastor, look, I, I can't raise my hand. I'm going to be embarrassed. Let me tell you something. Let me just share a thought with you. This is the best and most wise decision you will ever make, will ever make. Beyond investments, beyond everything else, this is the best decision you would ever make. Why on earth would you let a moment of irrational feeling of embarrassment stop you from making the very best decision you can ever make? It is your call. The Bible says that the gift of God is, uh, the gift of salvation is a gift of God. It's a free will choice. Heaven forbid God make us robots to, to design us to follow and serve him. He gave us the free will choice to choose him. It is your choice. It is your decision. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And it's your call. So who should raise their hands if you've never given him your heart? You've never given him your life. In just a moment, pop your hand up. Who should raise their hands if you're not sure? Maybe you did this at a harvest or a Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through with it. Come on, in just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. Who should raise their hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, been running from God instead of to God? In a moment, pop your hand up when I count to three. We'll do it all at the same time. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll go forward in your relationship with God. The decision is yours. The day of salvation for you is today. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment. Don't walk out of this place without being absolutely sure of where you stand with God. Oftentimes I hear, Pastor Luke, I have a hard time believing in heaven or believing in hell, or I have a hard time accepting a God who's in the business of rejecting or damning people to hell. Let me share something with you. First of all, just because you don't see it, just because you can't feel it, doesn't mean it's not real. Listen, everyone in this room fully understands that there are radio waves, even right now, going from me to that sound booth. Why? Because you can hear the sound of my voice. Yet you can't see them, you can't feel them, you know they exist. So come on, let's get over that. Just because you can't see it or can't feel it doesn't mean it's not real. It's real enough for God to speak of it. It's real enough for Jesus to teach about heaven and hell. It's real enough for you and I to take it seriously. On the second matter. God is not in the business of sending and damning you to hell or, con or, 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 or condemning people. Hell was not created for you. It was created for the devil and his angels, and it is not your business to go there. That is why God paid the ultimate price, Jesus Christ. 
his most valuable possession so that you could choose the gift that God offers, accept life, and have eternal life in heaven with God. But it is your choice and yours alone. Today is the day of your salvation all across this auditorium, from the front to the back, in the family rooms, whether you're watching on television or online or in the, by the sound of my voice around this campus, wherever you're at, this is your moment, this is your time. Let's not play any more games with God. Let's go forward today. I'm going to count and get ready. If that's you all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, pop your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll go forward in your relationship with God. Here we go. Ready? One. Two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three. I see you. Four, five. I got you. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I got you right there. Eleven. I see that hand. Eleven wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else in this place today? Eleven wise people. Twelve. I got you. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. I got you in the family room. Fifteen wise people. Sixteen in the back. Seventeen right there. Eighteen. I got you. Eighteen wise people. Anybody else? Nineteen. Twenty. I see those hands. I think I got you, but 21. We'll just be safe. 21 wise people. Listen, I didn't embarrass them. I didn't embarrass you. Come on, where are you at? 20, 22, 23, I can count. 23 wise people. Anybody else in this place? 24, I got you back there. Come on, where are you at? Anybody else? Oh, come on, 24, where are you at? Number 25, I see people pointing this way. 25, I see you. Praise God for 25 wise people. Hallelujah. 26 down there. Hey, you did it. You made the wise decision. Listen, those of you that raised your hand, those of you that didn't raise your hand, or maybe I didn't count you, I didn't see you. It's okay. Here's the deal. You don't get saved. Remember I said, this, you, this is, I want to do it. This is, Pastor Luke, I, I want to make this commitment. Today, we get saved. The Bible says in Romans, the 10th chapter, that when we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, risen from the dead, we shall be saved. Today, in just a moment, we want to change destinies. We want to pray with you. We want to uh, invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. So let's not do this alone. So here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, we're going to stand. Please, nobody leave at that time. Elijah's going to sing a song. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. All 25 of you, 26, 27, whoever else didn't know where I missed you, come on, grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you're in the family rooms, the ushers will come and help you grab whatever you need to grab. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come meet me here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. Come on. You can come. Coming. Come on, if that's you, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on. I can't count or some of you guys are starting off the wrong way. There's about 10 of you that should be up here. Come on, listen. Let's not play games. Sorry, you keep coming. Come on. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, this is your moment. If that's you, you need to be bold. Come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. It is worth it to you to come now. If that's you, come on. We'll wait for you. If that's you, you come. Come on. Come on. It's important enough. You are important enough to wait on. Come on. They're coming. You can come too. Come on. Let's welcome them home. If that's you, come on.
Hey, guys, you came. Praise God. Listen, you got to understand something. Today is the first day, remember we talked about this, of the rest of your life. You're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is your new birthday. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over there waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. Listen, he's going to take you right over there. I promise nothing weird goes on. I am as weird. As, oh, we talked about blood today. I mean, come on. Uh, it's about as weird as we could get right here. So nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Okay, you don't get saved by raising your hand, you get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. We're going to pray with you, okay? He's going to give you some free literature, some information to help get you strong, to point you in the right direction. And the last thing he's going to do is he's going to offer a friend. We give away friends. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, make sure that, that you're working that equipment that you have no clue how to use the right way. A spiritual personal trainer, somebody that will meet with you before church, to buy a cup of coffee, sit with you, teach you some things about the Word of God for five simple weeks, give you a really nice Bible at the end of that to help you get strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you came from, but you go forward in the life that God has for you. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.